Um, so let's move on um, uh, to uh, Nick Van Dyke and uh, Bill. If you can stay on, we'll we're going to hold questions till the very end. Sure. I should know this by now. Uh, I'd like to apologize on the behalf of uh, Dr. Fillmore, who wishes that he could have been here. Uh, he's in the Mediterranean, soaking up all the sun right now. So we feel very sorry. Yeah, that's for him. Uh, right. He's probably sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Probably with good wine to boot. Right, uh, but I'm very fortunate for this opportunity to share some of our research that I feel is uh, very relevant to a lot of the talks that have, um, uh, a lot of the issues that have been discussed throughout today. Uh, see if I can figure this thing out. I'd like to start just uh, kind of telling you a little bit about what we do. So it is, you know, somewhat different than a lot of the talks that have been uh, throughout the day today. Uh, our general interests are in drug addiction, substance abuse, um, drug-related cognitions, mental performance, things like that. Uh, and probably in the past decade or so, we've developed kind of a uh, somewhat in-depth uh, interest in traffic safety in studying alcohol impaired driving uh, and also distracted driving to some degree. And so with regard to our research on alcohol impaired driving, these are kind of some of the uh, areas that we have focused uh, predominantly on. Uh, the first one is just the basic alcohol's effect on driving. So what happens uh, you know, to somebody once they're intoxicated and then behind the wheel. Uh, we focus on the role of impulsivity in risky drinking and driving behaviors. Uh, we have begun to target some basic interventions uh, that uh, look to modify perceptions uh, of ability, willingness to drive, things like that, that might pose a risk for somebody to, um, you know, jump in that car after consuming a dose of alcohol. So that, that'll be something I talk about towards the end. Uh, and then we've examined a lot of high-risk populations. So we focused a lot on DUI offenders. We've had a research grant over the past five years to examine the effects of alcohol in DUI offenders. Uh, some of our early work with their driving simulators uh, focused on adults with ADHD. Um, basically, all these characteristics, uh, or one thing that pops up between these is traits of impulsivity, which has uh, kind of guided a lot of our recent studies and research, uh, and also is seen throughout the interventions that I'll talk about towards the end. I kind of wanted to give you guys a, a, just kind of a general layout of our a typical study that we do. Uh, they are, so our research is kind of almost at the confluence of behavioral pharmacology and then with aspects of cognitive behavioral tasks brought in. Uh, we bring in samples of, of male and female adults, often between 21 and 34 years of age. Uh, our sample sizes are anywhere from maybe as few as 10 up to about 50, uh, sometimes per group, and so they're relatively modest sample sizes. Uh, we have a, a whole host of background measures, drinking habits, uh, questionnaire data, imp impulsivity, different traits, things like that. Uh, they perform all of our tasks, whatever task is a part of that study, in the drug-free state. And so they get kind of get rid of all that learning stuff before we are uh, attempting to dose them. Uh, and our doses of alcohol that we use, I don't know, someone once got on me for saying a moderate dose of alcohol. So I'm going to call it a socially relevant dose of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so our doses of alcohol, uh, for example, we use a 0 0.50, this is grams per kilogram of body weight, uh, or a 0 0.65 grams per kilogram of body weight. And so those two doses are designed to target the, the current legal limit at a 0 0.08, and then the uh, recently proposed uh, decreased limit of a 0 0.05. Uh, and so, like it says the next point there, those yield BACs or breath alcohol concentrations anywhere between uh, a 50 milligrams per 100 milliliters up to maybe about a 90 milligrams per 100 milliliters, which would be about that 0.05 to 0.08 range. All of our studies are placebo controlled, um, so they often include many dose sessions where they're coming in several times, maybe three, four times per study, uh, and we will give them a specific dose on one day, they come back, get the next dose the next day, and so on. And Our basic modeling for, for the issue at hand for the alcohol impaired driving has been with a driving simulator. And so this has been some of our research for the past, uh, he's been working on this for maybe the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, and, and so we do our best to kind of model these real life driving behaviors in somewhat of a safe environment. Uh, and 
you know, the, the specifications are designed to be naturalistic. Uh, they're set up to the, I think the, the specs right now are to just like a sedan, uh, an everyday sedan that somebody might be driving on the road. Uh, and perhaps a, one real advantage of these uh, simulators is that we can really focus on isolating specific behaviors and examine these specific behaviors uh, under these doses of alcohol. <laughs> so I wanted to give you guys uh, an example of how we measure uh, driving performance in a simulator. Uh, this is one of the measures that uh, throughout the decades of driving research tends to pop up perhaps the most. Uh, and this would be the standard deviation of lateral position. Sometimes you hear it referred to, those terms kind of flipped around. Um, but basically, this is a fancy word for uh, how much is the person swerving uh, within their lane. And so the idea is that if you take the center of the lane, people are deviating a little bit to the left of that center point, a little bit to the right of that center point. Uh, and, and then quantifying that deviation gives us a measure of, in a sense, uh, poor driving performance or, or less skill, less ability to maintain that center point in the lane. And so if you look at the top part of that graph, you can see that that would be an SDLP measure or a value of approximately 25 centimeters. So a little bit of swerving, which was, is pretty natural. Uh, on the bottom half of there, we have a little bit more exaggerated swerving. And so the, the standard deviation measure uh, increases a little bit. <laughs> And so I wanted to give you, so we took our driving simulator, uh, we've looked at the statistics, and as you guys know by now throughout all of these talks, one of the populations that contributes just a disproportionate amount towards some of these negative um, statistics and public health costs is individuals with a history of driving under the influence of alcohol. And so a lot of our research has directly focused on these individuals. And interestingly enough, when we started to dive into this, we learned that Despite the fact that there is decades of, of information on these individuals that have been arrested for DUI, uh, we really still don't know a whole lot about them. And so the one thing that really keeps popping up was that they were impulsive. Well, you know, a level of trait impulsivity uh, could be displayed behaviorally in many different ways. And so we did not, really, we still did not know a whole lot about these people. We look at their driving records. We do see that they have increased rates of uh, uh, moving violations, speeding, traffic accidents, things like that. So it does appear that perhaps they are worse drivers or, or maybe they're taking more risks than people without DUI offenses. Uh, and one thing that also interestingly that has been talked about throughout our talks today is that prevention and treatment efforts have not been all that effective to reduce the problem. Uh, so I think that the reasons some people say up to approximately a third of first-time DUI offenders will go on to uh, acquire another DUI offense within about a five-year time period from that first offense. And so uh, perhaps existing methodologies to uh, to prevent this, to prevent recidivism, are not uh, targeting the right uh, aspects. And so I'll touch on that a little bit at, towards the end. <clears throat> so based on what we knew about these people, I just am going to guide you kind of towards where our thinking was at the time and the hypotheses that we were dealing with. Uh, based on the fact that these were identified to be people who are impulsive, uh, we thought that they might have issues with impulse control and that we might be able to see that in their driving performance. Uh, and going along with that, even though we, there is, was almost no information about how DUI offenders respond while they're intoxicated, uh, we had reason to suspect that perhaps they might be uh, even more impaired after a dose of alcohol than people without this DUI history. And then lastly, that third point, we had reason to suspect that perhaps uh, because these people are engaging in drinking and driving episodes more frequently than non-offenders, that perhaps uh, they, they think that they're better drivers or they, they possess a greater ability or even maybe a willingness to drive after drinking, which uh, poses a high level of risk. And so our very first study that looked at DUI offenders, uh, it was very informative. Uh, but one of the main things that we found was that there was no difference between DUI offenders and non-offenders on basic driving performance. So this would be uh, like their, their standard deviation of lane position measure. They performed just as poorly as non-offenders following a dose of alcohol. So both groups are impaired, uh, but there's no increased impairment in the DUI offenders. <laughs> Excuse me. 
We also found the same thing with uh, inhibitory control. This is a task that we've worked with for, uh, for or Dr. Fillmore has worked with for several decades. Uh, and there was no differences in inhibitory control in these DUI offenders. They estimated similar levels of intoxication, so they, they felt just as impaired. Uh, they performed at a similar level. They estimated themselves to be at similar BAC, so everything is matching up with where these non-offenders are at at this point. However, when we ask them, uh, how willing are you to drive a vehicle right now, or, or how able do you think you are to drive a vehicle right now, we started to see some pretty big differences. And so these DUI offenders uh, across, does this thing have a, yeah. This bottom graph here uh, assesses uh, the different time points at which we assessed your willingness and your ability to drive. The graph here is just showing willingness to drive. Um, the y-axis is a, it's a visual analog scale, and so basically these people are uh, along a continuum that goes from 0 to 100. They're placing a tick somewhere along that continuum of how willing or able they think they are to drive at that point. And so you see that first time point down in the corner here. This is 70 minutes after uh, consuming uh, our dose in the laboratory. And so this would be approximately the peak BAC. Uh, after that dose, we peak at about 60 to 70 minutes. And so you can see at that peak BAC, there is no difference. The DUI offenders and controls are, are just as willing, uh, report uh, similar abilities to drive uh, in their current state. But as you go across the declining limb, as BAC start to decline, this is where we start to see differences. DUI offenders are starting to be more able. Uh, they're starting to report a greater willingness to drive. Uh, and, and being that many decisions to drive are actually made on the declining limb as BACs are declining, this was a very interesting finding that has kind of uh, shaped some of these interventions that I'll talk about in the upcoming slides. <laughs> With regard to the driving performance, we, our, our SDLP measure did not pan out. Uh, we knew that these individuals are characterized by traits of impulsivity. We did not know how that impulsivity might be displayed behaviorally. Uh, and so in the driving literature, we often talk about uh, aspects of driving that maybe are reflective of somebody's skill or ability to drive the ability to uh, maintain your vehicle on the center of the road, the ability to uh, maintain small movements to the steering wheel rather than large exaggerated movements to correct for errors in your position. Uh, so there was no difference on that. So we're thinking perhaps, uh, you know, they don't possess less skill. Maybe there's no reason to expect that these people possess less skill than non-offenders. Perhaps maybe they are greater risk takers. So this is the other aspect of driving that uh, it doesn't receive a lot of research attention, but maybe equally important, especially in uh, these populations that uh, that do show traits of impulsivity. And so uh, we developed actually in our lab a risk taking model to be used in our driving simulator. And the risk taking model basically follows uh, a measure of proxemic. So where is your car relative to other things on the roadway? Um, often a car that's in front of you. So you're following a car on the road. How close do you place your car to that car in front of you? Uh, and so this would be indicative of your level of risk taking. So it's like a tailgating type measure. Uh, we assess it with what's called time to collision. And so if both cars, your car and the car in front of you are let's say going 60 miles per hour on the road, you're never going to hit each other, right, if you stay at that same speed. The time to collision measure provides a measure if that lead car were to stop, what would be the time until your driven car would crash into that car? And so we get a measure uh, in the number of seconds it would take to uh, create that crash. And so risky drivers or, or people who uh, show traits of impulsivity perhaps they are placing their car closer to other vehicles on the road or willing to take more risk. Um, if they're passing cars on the road, perhaps they're getting up closer to the lead car's bumper before making that lane switch. And so these would all be indicative of risky driving behaviors. We first wanted to validate our model. Uh, and one of the first things that we do with anything is, is this task sensitive to alcohol? If we give somebody a dose of alcohol, uh, will we see increased risk taking using this new risk drive scenario? And indeed we did. And so we saw that our time to collision, if you think about it, time to collision actually decreases as you become more risky because you're, you're placing your car closer to other vehicles. 
Uh, and so we've run several studies now, and we do find that alcohol does increase risk-taking, um, particularly at that uh, dose of alcohol that is designed to put you at the current legal limit of a 0.08. Interestingly, we've, we've done some analyses and studies that looked at both uh, maybe a skill-based measure and this new risk-taking measure, and we found them to be somewhat independent of one another. And so this indicates even in scenarios where uh, there's no evidence of impaired skill, you could still see in increased risk-taking. And so they, perhaps the, even though they are related, they could function somewhat independent of one another. We've also started to look at, so I know one thing that has popped up throughout the talks has been kind of these individual differences. The fact that uh, not everybody may be impaired at a certain BAC or, uh, you know, a BAC doesn't necessarily indicate impairment. Uh, and so we've started to look at these on an individual difference level by looking at the relationships between different variables uh, and aspects of impairment. And so one of the things that we've looked at is that would pose a risk for um, alcohol-related traffic crashes, fatalities, some of these statistics would be somebody underestimating their level of intoxication or their BAC. And so after a dose of alcohol, somebody may be at a BAC of a, a 0.08, for example, uh, but they may underestimate that BAC, think that they're at 0.05 or 0.04 or something like that. So they may be more willing to drive after that dose of alcohol than somebody who grossly overestimates and they think that they're you know, at a 0.1 or above and they realize that they're above the legal limit. And so on an individual difference level, we find that those who underestimate to the greatest degree, so they're underestimating the most, uh, are also the riskiest drivers. And so these would be the people that are perhaps should be really be targeted for different interventions. We've also done a fair bit of dose response testing with our focus on behavioral pharmacology. And so testing uh, are different tasks at different doses. If we go back to the more skill-based aspect of driving, there is a ton of literature out there that shows that um, the ability to maintain your vehicle on the road in, a, in the appropriate position on the road is well impaired at, at the current legal limit of a 0.08. Uh, there's also many studies that have shown that imp this impairment threshold actually would be below 0.08. And so there's a number of studies that have shown impairment at 0.05, um, a few even as low as I think like 0.03 in that area. Again, this is not for everybody, but just on, a, as a, on average. So again, taking our newest uh, risk-taking model uh, and then at the time hearing these uh, propositions to reduce the legal limit in the United States, uh, we wanted to figure out what is the threshold for risk-taking for drivers uh, or what BAC is that threshold for increased risk-taking. And so we tested, in one study, we tested uh, drivers in our new risk-driving scenario at the current legal limit and then at that uh, reduced 0.05 limit. And what we found is, yes, uh, risk-taking was increased at a 0.08 relative to placebo. So we've replicated some of those earlier findings. But interestingly, when going from a 0.08 down to a 0.05, we saw a significant uh, decrease in risk-taking. And so uh, perhaps this is evidence that, uh, you know, if, if we were to consider reducing the legal limit, we could alleviate some of that risk-taking on the road. The other factors to consider, uh, all of our driving scenarios are, are very isolated and in somewhat sterile environments. And so uh, we have done some work with distracted driving, but just recognizing that in, in a real scenario, um, people may have passengers in the car. They may be trying to, you know, change the radio station. There's a, there's a multitude of distractions um, that may exacerbate some of these impairments. In a basic study that looked at uh, or it included a basic simple distraction task where the participants had to respond to a button on the dashboard of the vehicle occasionally throughout the drive whenever a, a light popped up on the screen. Uh, and, and examining driving performance in response to this little simple distraction task, and we saw up to two to four times increased impairment. Uh, again, which we think was somewhat of a relatively simple distraction task. And so the idea that uh, some of these more complex risk-taking behaviors could, you know, maybe even more exacerbated in the real scenario when somebody's driving uh, with, with passengers or doing other things at the same time. So 
we wanted to go back to uh, that difference that we saw between DUI offenders and non-offenders in their willingness and ability to drive. We felt like there was something here. Uh, this possesses uh, perhaps uh, a mechanism by which these people continue to engage in this behavior. We know recidivism rates are very high. Treatments have shown very limited efficacy. <clears throat> and so uh, we have focused on changing those perceptions. And so this is kind of our, this first model was kind of like our proof of concept that to see if we could modify someone's uh, perceptions about their own willingness and ability to drive. And, and so we thought somebody's willingness to drive may be uh, caused by increased perception of ability. They think that they have a greater ability, so they're more willing to do it. And so our treatment target was to challenge this perception, to actually give them some feedback that might challenge their perceptions about how able or how willing they should be to drive. And the way that we did this was with a, a feedback, a behavioral feedback, so basically feedback on their performance. And so the procedure for this uh, basic intervention uh, spanned across two days. And so this may have been part of a larger study of three or four dose sessions, but this actual intervention uh, spanned across two different sessions. And so the first session, or the day one on the graph there, we would have our alcohol dose administration, so they would receive our dose of alcohol. Uh, we would assess their perceived ability to drive, so how able do you think you are to drive right now on a 100 millimeter visual analog scale? Then we would have them perform a drive test, and then we would give them some feedback about how they performed on that drive test. Mm -hmm. Then on a separate day, they would come back, receive that same dose of alcohol, and we would ask them to rate uh, their perceived ability to drive a vehicle right now. And so the behavioral feedback consisted of this. This was actually a, a bogus graph that we created. This was not actually their performance. Uh, but on the y-axis, we had increased uh, accident likelihood. And so we told them, every participant, that this is your subject, eight, 18. Um, you have this level of increased likelihood to, um, to be in a crash. And then we told you, uh, you know, you're here, but the rest of our sample is right here. So the rest of our sample actually have, possesses a much less likelihood. And so uh, you are even more impaired than average, is what this is saying. So here's what we found. Uh, we have perceived ability to drive. So this was our dependent measure on the y-axis here. Across the bottom, this was under placebo. So you can see DUI offenders and control drivers under placebo uh, are both pretty reporting a, a sufficient ability to drive. You know, they, they don't feel super intoxicated. It is, uh, we've, you know, it's a validated placebo dosing procedure, so they often report consuming a few, a few drinks, uh, but they are not feeling too intoxicated. Under alcohol, we see perceived ability drop uh, as expected, and this is where we start to see the differences. So DUI offenders are reporting significantly greater ability to drive than non-offenders. Then on the expectancy challenge, so when we've now challenged their perceptions about their ability to drive, we see that DUI offenders actually significantly drop their uh, perceived ability to drive. And when control drivers or non-offenders are really not doing much at all. And so we are seeing this nice little decrease in these people who are considered very high risk. And so this is kind of our basic step to say, hey, perhaps we could expand upon this model a little bit. Are they significantly different? Uh, these two are not. Is that what you're, yeah. yeah. So what we know so far, we know that they have increased rates of impulsivity. Uh, other studies have actually shown that they have increased attentional bias to alcohol. So uh, when they see alcohol cues in the environment, they may be more drawn to them, uh, may, may be more likely to engage in a drinking episode. Uh, they have less perceived impairment, and they are more willing to drive after consuming a dose of alcohol. And so perhaps this is suggestive that they have less consideration of what we call these risk-relevant situational factors. So when somebody is making a decision to drive after drinking, they might base it on a few different factors. And perhaps uh, they could be uh, the time since my last drink might be one factor. How long has it been since my last drink? Um, how far do I have to drive? If it's only a few miles, perhaps I, I may be more willing to drive than if it's uh, many more miles. And then what is my probable BAC? 
And so these are different situational factors that could potentially be targeted. And so this is some pilot data that we actually have on the bottom here, um, looking at DUIs and controls. And what we did here is we say, oh, the bar you are at uh, has a breathalyzer. Uh, and you take this breathalyzer, let's suppose you're at all these different BACs. So this is a, there's many different responses that these people are responding to. And you can see across all different BACs, DUI offenders are willing to drive at these different BACs for much less money. So this was kind of the other factor. How much money would it take you to drive if you were at this specific BAC? Across all these different BAC levels, DUI offenders were more willing to do it for less money. And we saw this with all uh, three of our different factors here. And so this is actually a paper that is currently being written up right now, um, one of our newest models. Again, keeping in mind that perhaps the real issue here is with those recidivist offenders. Like I said, uh, a significant proportion of DUI offenders are reoffending. Uh, perhaps uh, the, these are the real problem people that should be targeted. A lot of our samples do not include a lot of recidivist offenders because they tend to uh, not qualify for our studies. They have history of psychiatric illnesses, medications. They tend to be older. Um, and so it has been a little bit difficult to uh, study this population. The one thing that, that seems to be somewhat incongruent with existing treatments is the idea uh, that these people, are, it's just a problem with alcohol, that DUI offenders just possess an issue with alcohol, that they drink too much or they uh, show signs of dependence and things like this. But this isn't really supported by the drinking data. And so a lot of our data indicates that they're not drinking a whole lot more than, than non-offenders. Uh, what we think is going on is it's, it's likely a problem of self-regulation. And so uh, they, just, they just not have the ability to regulate their behavior, particularly when under the influence of alcohol. And so we identify a need to focus on these perceptions of impairment uh, that we have shown that we can manipulate and that we will expand upon. Uh, and then also acknowledging that they possess a heightened bias to alcohol. So they may be more likely to engage in these drinking behaviors even when they, when they don't plan to. Uh, than non-offenders. So these are both kind of mechanisms of risk. And so something that we're really excited about that we are focusing on now that uh, we're working on a grant proposal for is expanding on these uh, kind of challenges to their perceptions. Um, being able to give them specific feedback of where their BAC is, what their performance is, and have them in a sense learn to be more accurate estimators of their impairment. And this is an issue that has popped up in some of the earlier talks. Uh, and so we've looked at including some brief interventions, um, some techniques from mindfulness, maybe like body scan techniques to get people to um, kind of recognize some of these interoceptive cues of intoxication and things like that. Uh, this is still very early in the process, so we're still working on a lot of that, but something we're really excited about going forward. And our acknowledgments and then our, the grant funding that had uh, funded these studies. Great, thanks. Um, 